Namaskar. I am grateful to all of you who have joined today to remember the 81st anniversary of the Quit India Movement, which was an important milestone, a landmark in India's struggle for freedom and was the last and undoubtedly the sharpest fight for freedom ever waged against the British rule in India. I thank the Indian Mission for hosting this talk during the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of India's independence. In August 1942, the Quit India movement was launched by Mahatma Gandhi during his speech, which demanded an end to the British rule in India. Gandhiji made a call to do or die in his Quit India speech, which he delivered at Gabalia tank ground on that day. Bombay was perhaps the most suited to the agitation as it had played a leading ro role in all the non-violent Satyagraha movements and its contribution to the two decades long non-violent movement was substantial. It was the leader in the boycott of foreign clothes and Bombay's public squares had witnessed bonfires of foreign clothes. Both the communities had jointly addressed the meetings in mosques and temples. Thousands of Satyagrahis were incarcerated in the jails. The Second World War had reached the Indian shore by 1941-42. This had shaken the invincible image of the British forces. There was immense fear and anxiety among the Indian masses and resentment against the humiliating, uncivilized and obscene behavior of the white soldiers towards Indians. Gandhiji appealed for calm amidst fear and uncertainty and recommended establishing of the village defense units to guard against looting and robbing in times of anarchy. There was famine in parts of India and the government's action for supplying food to the remote areas proved difficult. Such and similar other incidences convinced Mahatma Gandhi to take a stand that the only solution was that the British should withdraw from India. He saw this as beneficial for both the parties, India and England. Therefore, Gandhiji demanded British rulers should withdraw from India. His demand for the British withdrawal was a result of the unnerving conditions created by the World War and his own assessment of the British character. Gandhiji appeared optimistic about the outcome. The Quit India movement surpassed all the earlier movements, including the Great Revolt of 1857 in dimensions and intensity. People from all the provinces of India took part in it. The upsurge of masses and their readiness to sacrifice everything for the emancipation of the motherland showed their grim determination to throw off the foreign oppression. It was a civil disobedience movement launched because of Mahatma Gandhi's call for Satyagraha. Since 1936, he had been in his Sevagram ashram in Maharashtra, leading a life of voluntary poverty and bread labor, and was involved in mobilizing and training Indians to dedicate themselves for constructive programs for establishing justice and dignity for the poor people living in the villages of India. On 25th February 1942, Winston Churchill, the then Prime Minister of England appointed a subcommittee to study the Indian problem. The committee sent Sir Stafford Cripps, a British statesman, a member of the War Cabinet and a diplomat to discuss the British government's draft declaration on the Constitution of India with certain conditions. It said that India should be made a republic with the condition that she will join the Commonwealth as a dominion associated with the United Kingdom. Cripps wanted to hold discussions with the representative Indian leaders from all parties about this proposal. He came to India with a personal prestige, goodwill and authority on 22nd March 1942 and began his work on the same day. He met most of the Indian leaders except Mahatma Gandhi. The British Viceroy in Lithgow advised him to talk to Mahatma Gandhi if he wanted to su succeed in his mission. They requested Mahatma Gandhi to come to Delhi from his Sevagram, Sevagram Ashram in Maharashtra. Both met on 27th March 1942 and the meeting lasted well over two hours. The, the proposal seemed to Gandhiji as laughable. Gandhiji saw the shortcomings clearly and said that the proposal was like a post-dated check. Later, Cripps reported 
about Gandhiji's remarks in these words, and I quote, he said, he thought it would have been better if I had not come to India with a cut and dried scheme to impose upon Indians, unquote. Cripps continued having dialogues with other leaders, but did not meet Gandhiji again. Most of the political parties and the groups of that time rejected the proposal later. Cripps mission was a failure subsequently, and they blamed the Congress and Gandhiji for the failure of his mission, which was not true. Cripps left India on 12th April for England. Gandhiji feared that the country would despair at this failure. The sense of fear produced by the war, the anger at the racist behavior of the white army and the political failure would combine to make Indian hearts sadder. It would need a great act to uplift the country from the despair, anger and fear that enveloped it. With a deep prayer, Gandhiji searched his conscience to guide him towards this act. In April 1942, he placed a draft resolution proposing that the British should withdraw from India for the sake of their own safety, for the security of India and for the cause of the world peace. He said that in the event of the Japanese aggression, the Indian people would offer non-violent, non-cooperation to the aggressors. After some amendments by Dr. Rajendra Prasad, who later became the first president of the independent India, the resolution was passed. Gandhiji's philosophy was based on the principles of truth and non-violence. His dream was rooted in an immense and inexhaustible faith in the people of India. He had the confidence that the ordinary people of India were capable of offering enormous sacrifice for the freedom of the country. This could even include voluntary sacrifice of life by a large mass of people. In May, June and July 42, Gandhiji was busy in the preparations before launching the Satyagraha. He prepared the transfer of power document for launching the struggle. His women disciples such as Meera Ben, Khurshid Ben Noroji, Rudula Sarabhai, Rajkumari Amrutkar and others were sent on the tour of different provinces to prepare the public for participating in the movement. He called his associates and confided in them about his plans. Gandhiji was confident that the strategy would evolve in response to the changing circumstances. He felt instinctively that now was the time to test nonviolence. In all his experiments with nonviolence, Gandhiji had remained steadfast to the ideals, but changed his strategy to suit the demands of the situation facing him. From the beginning, he had faith in one force, the power of truth as God. The British government had made full preparations to suppress the movement even before it was launched. They even planned to fly Gandhiji and some other leaders to Aden or Uganda. But it was given up in view of Gandhiji's health, opposition of the Indian members of the Viceroy's Executive Council, and it was decided instead to detain Gandhiji in Pune in Maharashtra. The main emphasis in the Quit India Resolution was that Non-violence is the basis of the movement. It also said that ending the foreign rule is our aim, subject to inexorable condition of non-violence. There was no mention of any type of sabotage and violence, and they directed the movement to follow the traditional practice of Satyagraha. In the month of August 1942, two sides faced each other in the battle for freedom. On one side were the British rulers, on the other, an ocean of satyagrahis. The first side was led by Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who had declared that he had not assumed power to oversee the dismantling of the empire. The army of satyagrahis was led by a man who had discovered a new mode of struggle. He had experimented with it for over three decades and a half in two continents, and its method and usage had changed with every satyagraha. Mahatma Gandhi had brought a new turn and a new element to his strategy every time. The real strength of this leader was soul force and his determination was no less than the man who opposed him. His associates were men and women of great virtue who had, through fiery ordeals, purified themselves. The millions of Indians were the foundation of the Satyagrahi army. The British government was prepared in every respect four days before the leaders met in Bombay in the first week of August 1942 for the session. Thousands of people had reached Bombay and waited for Mahatma Gandhi's command 
and their focus was on the events that were to unfold at the Gabalia tank ground. Gandhiji had asked the British to voluntarily leave India for their own good. This appeal was etched in the hearts of the people in two words, quit India. These two words had electrified the people. Moreover, Gandhiji had also said that each one was his or her own leader within the limits of nonviolence in this short and decisive struggle. People were eager to give a momentum to the struggle. The educated sections of Indians had voluntarily and gladly gone to jail for the first time during the non-cooperation movement. During the civil disobedience movement of 1930-32, women had come through as brave warriors. This time, young and old, women and men were ready to take the plunge till their last breath. The volunteers were no less enthusiastic than the leaders. Their faces glowed despite the fatigue of sleepless nights over the previous two or three days. As the leaders came on the stage, the crowds hailed them. The enthusiasm, the passion and hailing did not disturb the meticulous organization. The mood of the meeting was best captured in the speech given by Mahatma Gandhi's closest associate, Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Each sentence inspired people to struggle, demolish the charges made by the opponents, and yet it had the discipline of a Satyagrahi soldier. In his speech, Sardar Patel said, and I quote, We are starting last struggle for independence, so some persons threaten us and say that if we start the struggle, we will invite trouble. Some advise that we will be hampering war efforts. We have answers to all these threats and advice. We are promised independence after the war, but we have no faith that they will free us. We do not want to drive them by violence. Our weapon is non-violence. The weapon has enhanced our prestige since the last 20 years. Your act should be non-violent. The eyes of the world are fixed on us. And so everybody amongst us has to show to the world what and where India is. Till Gandhiji is out, he is our commander. But he... If he is arrested, then nobody's responsibility will be on nobody's head. All the responsibility will be on the heads of the Britishers. The responsibility of chaos will also be there. There is no other way. We want to be independent. We won't tolerate our slavery even for a moment. Unquote. Gandhiji has spent the past four months in deep anguish and turmoil for making the mass awakening possible. When he rose to speak at the session, there was pin drop silence and high expectations among the leaders and the audience. He was not certain what he was going to tell people. Gandhiji could not sleep the previous night as there was so much pressure to say so much. And he wondered how he would manage that. But immediately he thought that if God wanted him to speak, he would help him talk. Otherwise, he would just say that he was not certain what he wanted to tell people today. But God helped him to speak up. Gandhiji was also skeptical that maybe today could be the last moment of his life. But again, he thought, if God plans to get this task done by him, he will give him strength. And God gave him just that. Mahatma Gandhi addressed the session thrice. He opened his heart on August 8, 1942. Delegates listened attentively to his two and a quarter hour long speech. He bared his soul before the enduring and enthusiastic audience. He said, and I quote, You may take it from me that it is a matter of life and death. We must unite without the slightest mental reservation on the part of either community in the effort to be free from the shackles of this empire. I therefore want freedom immediately, this very night before dawn, if it can be had. I have traveled all over India, as perhaps nobody in the present age has. The voiceless millions of the land saw in me their friend and representative, and I identified myself with them to an extent it was possible for a human being to do so. I saw trust in their eyes, which now I want to turn to a good account in fighting this empire upheld on untruth and violence. However gigantic the preparation that the empire has made, we must get out of its clutches. Every one of you, from this moment onwards, consider yourself a free man or woman 
and act as if you are free and no longer under the heel of this imperialism. It is not a make-believe that I am suggesting to you. It is the very essence of freedom. The bond of the slave is snapped the moment he considers himself to be a free being. Here is a mantra, a short one that I give you. You may imprint it on your hearts and let every breath of yours give expression to it. The mantra is, do or die. We shall either free India or die in the attempt. Keep jails out of your consideration. If the government keeps me free, I will spare you the trouble of filling the jails. I will not put on the government the strain of maintaining a large number of prisoners at a time when it is in trouble. Let every man and woman live every moment of his or her life hereafter in the consciousness that he or she lives for achieving freedom and will die if need be to attain that goal. Take a pledge with God in your conscience as witness. You will no longer rest till freedom is achieved and will be prepared to lay down your lives in the attempt to achieve it. He who loses his life will gain it. He who seeks to save it will lose it. Freedom is not for the coward or the faint-hearted." Gandhiji made special appeals to the press, the princes, the public servants and the students. He spoke, direct, he spoke directly to the foreign press assembled at the venue and said, and I quote, through you, I wish to say to the world that United Nations who say they have a need for India have the opportunity now to declare India free and prove their bona fides. If they miss it, they will be missing opportunity of their lifetime and history will record that they did not discharge their obligation to India in time and lost the battle. I want the blessings of the whole world so that I may succeed with them." Unquote. After the speech, the streets of Bombay were agog with rumors that Gandhiji and other leaders would be arrested. In the early morning of 9th August at 4 a.m., Gandhiji was arrested along with his secretary Mahadev Desai and his British disciple Meera Bhan. Sardar Patel was arrested earlier at night for his stern speech. Gandhiji's wife, Kasturba Gandhi, and another of his secretaries, Pyarelal Nayar, were given a chance. They could accompany Gandhiji if they so desired, a little bit as prisoners. Otherwise, they were not to be detained. It was a difficult problem for Kasturba Gandhi. Should she accept imprisonment or stay out to carry on Gandhiji's work? She sought Gandhiji's counsel. And Gandhiji said, and I quote, if you ask me what I would like you to do, then I would like that you address the Shivaji Park meeting in Bombay on my behalf and get arrested on your own right. But I would not prevent you from coming with me. It is possible that they may not keep you with me after your arrest. You should decide considering all these." Unquote. Kasturba Gandhi's predicament was severe. But she arrived on the great decision in a fraction of a moment. She spoke in a grave voice and said, and I quote, If you ask me what I would like to do, it would be to stay with you. But more than that, I would like to fulfill your desire. I will stay back." Unquote. On 9th August, as Kasturba Gandhi stepped out to address the meeting at Shivaji Park, she was arrested. Gandhiji's arrest marked the launch of the movement spontaneously. The government's response to the movement was quick. Almost all the leaders were imprisoned without trial within few hours of Gandhiji's speech. Many of the imprisoned stayed during the war in the prisons with no contacts from outside world. The city plunged into general strikes, processions, demonstrations, charkha spinning, picketing against shops of foreign clothes and liquor, flag salutation ceremonies, political meetings, and the outburst of popular unrest. After the arrest of numerous leaders, people took over the command of the movement. Quit India movement demonstrated tenacity and bravery, defiance and determination, forgiveness and perseverance of people. Famous leaders and little known or unknown men and women played a major role. They created history with their passion for the motherland and the drive for freedom. Gandhiji's leadership was charismatic and people's participation astounding. Although they had their moments of despair and desolation, they surpassed the obstacles of violent outbursts and repression by the British. Together, they opened uncharted avenues to reach the destination of independence. 
An aspect of the Quit India movement that is rarely spoken about is the way it encouraged Indian women to come out of the thresholds of their homes and raise their voice against the British rule. Women were active throughout the movement. As most of the leaders and men were behind bars, women took to the streets, raising slogans, holding public lectures, organized processions, distributed bulletins and other nationalist, nationalist leaflets, held demonstrations, continued spinning, taught Hindustani and brought Gandhiji's message in the precincts of home. The women of India at large were endowed with a new spirit on the call of Mahatmas do or die. There are few women whose contribution history can never forget, like Usha Mehta of Bombay, who kept up the struggle through the underground radios, passionately propagating the message of freedom and disseminating information about the struggle against the coercive rule of the British government. Aruna Asafali unfurled the national flag at the hoisting ceremony at the Gavalia tank ground on August 9, 1942. Sucheta Kriplani established contacts with groups still active throughout India and encouraged them to continue non-violent activities. Dr. Sushila Nayar was imprisoned with Kasturba Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi and Mahadev Desai in Aga Khan Palace Jail in 1942. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur led processions day after day, faced the police brutality 15 times and was arrested subsequently. Matangini Hazra from Midinapur district, West Bengal, led 6,000 supporters holding the tricolor flag high to capture the Tamluk police station until she was shot dead by the British Indian police in front of the Tamluk police station on 29 September 1942. Students from various institutions and colleges were active during the moment. The government took recourse to arrest and firing, leading to further chaos and disorder. Unrest spread to the interiors of the Bombay Presidency. Like in the other provinces, the police and the British Army in India led a violent crackdown, arresting over 100,000 persons. The total civilian deaths after the Quit India protests, however, were closer to 1,000. The underground press contributed to getting Mahatma Gandhi's mantra out to the masses. Do or die became the unifying rallying cry for the civil disobedience campaign that spread across the subcontinent and lasted from August 1942 to September 1944. The traditional Indian attitude of passivity somehow vanished. This was truly something great accomplished by Gandhiji. Perhaps he himself was not aware of the forces he was unleashing. The greatest impact Gandhiji made was in making the Indians shed their innate fear. He restored to the Indians the erect posture and made them look any foreigner in the face. He made people shed the fear of heavy sticks, the prison, even the bullets. This was no mean achievement and since it was done, it could not delay the freedom much longer. The Indian by 1930 had, so to say, found his soul. This came to be carried on a little further in the Quit India movement. What is remarkable is the fact that Gandhiji had faith in people's power right from the beginning of his struggle, a faith that rarely found an echo in the government or in the minds of the leaders and intellectuals of India. This was the faith that rattled the colonial rule in India, and this was the faith that stirred nationalist spirit during the Quit India movement. The mom momentum it provided in securing the country's independence proved unstoppable. The British government realized it was impossible to keep India under reins in the long run. Finally, India gained freedom on 15th August 1947. It was a defining moment in bringing an end to colonialism in other parts of the world too. As Gandhiji had visualized and predicted, the freedom to India paved way to the freedom to most of the colonies of Asia and Africa. I once again take this opportunity to thank the Indian mission for hosting the talk. My special thanks are to all of you who have joined me online. Namaskar.